Good morning. Welcome to worship. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing our call to worship. Oh, come, all ye faithful. Often with the baptism. We'll observe the ordinance of baptism this week and next week. We'll observe the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So we hope you'll be here and join us for that as well. Uh, we've entered into the Christmas season, and along with that comes our Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. The envelopes are in the back of the pews in front of you. So make sure you take part in that. All of this will go into our international mission fund. Uh, many other things going on. Of course, you can see we have our uh, friends from Oklahoma joining us. They'll be here for the duration of the month. They are helping to rebuild a church in Homa. Uh, if you have the opportunity to go and join them, they'll take you for a day or two or three or four or every day you want to go. Uh, you just let them know. Uh, they'll put you to work, and I promise you there's something there that anybody and everybody can do. And if you don't want to go there, you can come here and help. There will be some meals that will be uh, feeding them in the evening, some cleanup to do. Um, speaking of disaster relief, uh, if you are interested in joining the force in Louisiana for disaster relief and you want to be trained, there's a, a card like this out in the foyer that has dates on it. We're looking at two specific dates and locations. One of them will be in New Orleans on January the 28th and 29th. The other one will be in Baton Rouge on February the 4th and the 5th. That's the one that I'm looking at going to. So if you're interested in getting qualified, you want to be there, get the T-shirt, get the cap, get the certification and the badge, and be ready to go the next time the opportunity presents itself and you want to be trained, this is your opportunity to do that. Also in the foyer, there's a sign-up sheet for our evangelism conference coming up in January. That will be on the 24th and 25th. If you want to go to this, it's going to be an overnight stay. It's going to be in Covington at First Baptist Church. We need to know this by December 26th so we can make reservations. Also, on the 25th, that Tuesday, 
There is a senior adult luncheon, and we do need to have you signed up for that. This, uh, this conference is of no cost. The only cost will be the overnight stay uh, and whatever meals you eat during that time. Uh, coming up this week, uh, Men's Fellowship, Thursday night, 6 o'clock. We're going to our usual place, or are we coming here? Brother Gerald. We're going to our usual place. Okay. <laughs> That's to be announced, so uh, we'll let you know about that. <laughs> Also, in your bulletin, there's a flyer for, uh, we're looking for two members to serve on our committee of committees. There's a list of names. If you don't mind, please fill that out. Sometimes today while you're here, drop it in the offering plate or give it to me on your way out. Uh, whatever two names you prayerfully consider to be on this committee, uh, and we would appreciate that. Also out in the foyer, you'll see a couple of other things Christmas related. One is our Christmas card post office. It's laid on the pew over uh, to your left as you exit. If you want a Christmas card delivered to a church member, uh, you bring it to us and give us 25 cents. All proceeds for that will go to Operation Christmas Child for next year. So also with the Christmas season, uh, it is a season of giving. Uh, in a box out in the foyer we have uh, is full of these buttons. There's two different styles that you can bring. Now these are for you to wear but they're not necessarily for you to keep. If someone admires it and you want to talk to them about who Jesus is, what he means in the true meaning of the season, you let them have that bucket and say, God loves you, but he has something more for you than just this button. He has eternal life. And you can share the gospel with them. So lots of opportunities for you to serve and be involved. <laughs> Baptism. Before I got here, before I got started in the pastor, somebody told me, you'll never forget your first year as a pastor. And boy, were they right. There are certain times and certain days that are embedded in my mind, and one of them is October 31st. As I was getting ready to give the invitation, the water began pouring across the foyer. I said, oh, no, what's fixing to happen here? Not only that, but this young lady that I'm about to introduce to you, she came forward and gave her heart to Jesus Christ. She had some confusion. She had some questions. But uh, we met a few days after that, uh, and we just got it all lined out. And so now she's ready to present herself for church membership and baptism. And I want to remind you that this water is not what washes our sins away. The blood of Jesus Christ, and only the blood of Jesus Christ, cleanses us of our sins. But baptism is our way of identifying ourselves with the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It symbolizes the old person being laid to rest and a new person being created in Jesus Christ. And so now I present to you Miss Julianne Dinger, October 31st, she came forward and gave her heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and now presents herself for baptism. Hold on a <laughs> second. So, based on her profession of faith, uh, I present to you Ms. Julianne Dinger. Ms. Julianne, you now know that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Amen. Amen. And so now, I present you. Father God, we thank you for Ms. Julianne. We thank you for all you're doing in her life, and we just pray that you'll do mighty things in and through her. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Julianne, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The old person laid to rest, and the new person raised to life. Amen. And a week later, this next person came forward, and after I talked with her and counseled with her, we got some things squared away. Somebody came up to me and told her, she said, that's the one I've been praying for. Amen. So who is your one? Yep. We're still doing that. If you're not praying for someone, we have books and cards for you to walk through each and every day and pray a specific prayer for that person that the Lord has laid on your life. And maybe eventually you might get to see this, this person that you've been praying for come to faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And so Miss Annie came the following Sunday. This is Miss Denise Gant. She too has some questions, but now she is sure about her relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, so we want to pray for her as well. Father God, we thank you for Miss Denise, and we pray for the 
profession of faith that she's made, and we just pray that as she steps out in newness of life, Lord God, that you'll do great and mighty things in and through her life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Miss Anique, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The old person laid to rest. And the new person raised to newness of life. Amen. So thank you for joining us today. If you're visiting today, take the time to fill out a visitor information card. They're located in the back of the pews in front of you. Uh, hand those to me on your way out or put those in the offering plate as well. Uh, if you're tuning in through Facebook Live, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're praying for you as well. If you have a prayer request, please drop us a line and let us know. Uh, there's also prayer request cards in the back of the pews as well. If you have a specific prayer need, we want to be praying for you as well. So. Check your bulletins. Make sure you don't miss out on any of those events. Uh, share the love of Jesus during this Christmas season. And uh, we look forward to uh, choir practice on Wednesday night. If you want to get in on some of this good Christmas music that we're practicing. We had a blast Wednesday night. And uh, we'll be doing a Christmas special each Sunday until Christmas. Father God, we thank you so much for all you're doing. We thank you for this time of worship, Lord. I thank you for these two uh, that have uh, made professions of faith, Lord. I pray that you would do great and mighty things through their lives. Lord, we pray for more people like that to give their hearts and their souls. That's what we're here for. I, I pray for laborers for the harvest, Lord God. I know that the harvest is plenteous, but we need people that will faithfully go out and proclaim the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But today we want to lift our voices to you, Lord God, through song and worship. We also want to hear from you, Lord God, as we study your word. So I pray that as we open your word later on, uh, that we would feast upon it, our souls would be refreshed, and uh, you would strengthen us through what you have to say through your word. I thank you for this group that has come all the way from Oklahoma to support the people in our area and our community. I pray that you'll guide them, strengthen them, protect them, and I just look forward to having a good time and fellowship with them as they come here and serve you, Lord God. But now we want to worship you. And we turn this service over to you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing about Jesus and his birth. Hymn number 77 is Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. stands as we sing off to him. Star of wonder, star. 
Rumor has it that we might uh, experience a musical special tonight. So we'll uh, we'll see how that works out, and you don't want to miss out on that. I guarantee you, it's going to be a blessing either way. Uh, we're going through the Book of Proverbs on Sunday nights, and we hope that you'll join us for that. We just started a study in the Book of Acts on Wednesday night. Uh, currently, we are going through. The seven I am's that Jesus proclaimed in the gospel of John. Uh, Today we are still in John chapter 10. Uh, The first week we, we're not necessarily doing them in order uh, as the book presented them. Uh, I've kind of laid them out to go along with the Christmas theme and then we're going to wrap up uh, with one that goes along with the sanctity of life on the first Sunday of January uh, right after Christmas. So Uh, We're doing them in somewhat of a specific order to go along with the holiday theme. Uh, The first Sunday, we we talked about the first I am. Uh, I am the bread of life, Uh, how Jesus is our supplier, our sustainer in all things. Uh, Last week, we opened up John chapter 10, talking about how Jesus is the door of the sheep pen. He is the only entrance, uh, the only place where we can find refuge and safety. Uh, Today we will continue on with the motif of a shepherd uh, that is opened up in John chapter 10. As we look at the good shepherd, Jesus presented himself, I am the good shepherd. And so as we are in this holiday season, as we're in the Christmas season, um, the the manger scenes come out, the nativity scenes come out. Uh, We see the nativity plays with the little kids acting out. Most of the times... The ones that gets the most attention are the the wise men. Uh, Typically, you see them presented as three wise men because of the three specific gifts that are mentioned, but it doesn't really say how many there were present at the time. It just mentions the gifts that they brought. So there could have been many. There could have been fewer. But the shepherds themselves, we don't know how many in number there were on that first Christmas day. So the, the motif, the analogy of a shepherd all the way through Scripture carries a very, very heavy uh, connotation to it. And there's no reason at all why the first people to receive the announcements of the birth of the Messiah would be the shepherd. Understanding the greatness of the theme and the overarching theme throughout Scripture of that of a shepherd. We first see the shepherd uh, motif, analogy brought forth. In the life of Moses, uh, we just studied that in our Sunday school lesson. Moses was uh, on flee from Pharaoh. Uh, he was working as a shepherd for his father in the land of Midian in the backside of the wilderness. And there on Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, uh, God came to him and said, I am is going to be the one that sends you to shepherd my people through the wilderness into the promised land. So not only was Moses presented in a shepherd's role, he led the Israelites out of Egypt through the Exodus, led them to the promised land, all the way up to the promised land. Moses was serving as a shepherd at the time he received the calling. Another person that came along was David. David was serving as a shepherd for his father Jesse when the prophet Samuel came and anointed him to be the next king of Israel. So the comparison between David and Jesus in the aspect of a a shepherd is extremely strong. God spoke about this through the prophet Ezekiel when he wrote, My servant David will be king over them. Of course, Ezekiel came along after the days of David. He said, And there will be one shepherd for all of them. He wasn't talking about David anymore, but he was prophesying about another shepherd coming to shepherd the people of Israel. So the one king, one shepherd referred to here clearly in Ezekiel is Jesus Christ. So God also gave encouragement to those who would serve faithfully as the shepherd of God's people through the prophet uh, Jeremiah. He, He encouraged them, but he also gave some severe warnings to those who would improperly uh, shepherd God's people. He referred to them as the bad shepherds. And in Jeremiah chapter 23, 1, he says, Woe to those who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. This is the Lord's 
declaration. And so one of the Old Testament prophets was actually a shepherd. He called himself a herdsman. His name was Amos. And God called him to leave his position as a shepherd or a herdsman. And he went to warn the house of Israel. And so also it was on the shore of Tiberias, the Sea of Tiberias, where Jesus restored Peter the apostle after Peter had denied knowing who Jesus was. There by a campfire on the shore of the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus asked Peter three specific times, Peter, do you love me? First time Peter said, of course, Lord, you know I love you. And he said specifically, feed my sheep. But the second time he got even more specific and he used the analogy of a shepherd. He asked him a second time, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, of course, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, shepherd my sheep. Feed my lambs and shepherd my sheep. And so it's no wonder that Peter himself, when he wrote his epistle, that he would give warnings and encouragement also to those who would shepherd God's flocks. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And the Apostle Paul, as he was planting churches all throughout Asia Minor, all around the Mediterranean Sea, in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul also uses the analogy to warn overseers or those who shepherd the flock of God to protect them from the wolves that would be among them. So this theme, this, this motif, this analogy of a shepherd is very, very strong all throughout Scripture, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. And as you read through the Christmas story, there's really no wonder at all why the shepherds that were out in the field that night would be the first ones that the angels would come to. And as they received the good news that the, the Messiah had been born, that the Christ child had been born, the angels told them exactly where to find him at, Bethlehem, the city of bread. They left their flocks and they went and they worshiped. So this motif, this theme about a shepherd, as we think about it, I want us to think about it not only as Jesus Christ as our good shepherd, but as I mentioned several times here, the pastor or the overseer is also referred to as the shepherd of a flock. So this third I am that we're studying, Jesus claims that he is the good shepherd. And so it's also connected with last week's claim as Jesus being the gate to the sheep pen, spoken of in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. So let's stand as we read. We'll pick up in chapter 10, beginning in verse 11. Jesus says clearly, after he claims himself being the door of the sheep pen, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not with the shepherd, or he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Exactly what Ezekiel spoke about just a few moments ago. Therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. And, and I almost, I made the decision earlier this week not to read this next part, but there's something very significant included in this next part. Therefore, there was a division against among the, uh, again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? Others said, 
These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And here's a significant part. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem, and it was winter. Number one, the feast of dedication is also known as Hanukkah, which was just this past Monday, November 29th. Also, it happened in the winter. This is the time that when the shepherds would bring their flocks down out of the mountains into the valleys to keep them in the ranch and keep them through the harsh months of the winter. So his flock is there among them at this time. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do... In my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. And I said to you, my sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Isn't that good stuff right there? That's where I'm shouting hallelujah over right there. I and my Father are one. God, we thank you so much for these promises that you give us in your word. God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us in a way that we've never seen before. I pray that you'd speak to us in a way that we've never heard before. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would move about this congregation and just do great and mighty things. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I am the good shepherd. And so with this thought in mind, with everything that we just read, also with it in mind that the good shepherd, the shepherds of the sheep, the shepherds of the flock, the shepherds of the congregation are also viewed as overseers or pastors. With with that in mind, I want us to look closely this morning at several aspects or several qualities of a good shepherd. Number one, a good shepherd's life is sacrificial. And Jesus made that clear in his opening statement. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Needless to say, a shepherd would be more than willing to put his life on the line for just one of his sheep. He does it for the entire flock, though. The good shepherd will also never force his sheep to go somewhere he's not willing to personally lead them himself. As we talked about last week, he says, I go to before you. I lead you down that path. I take you to the places that are going to be beneficial for you. But not only that, I'm also looking out for dangers along the way. I am putting my life in jeopardy by going in front of you. He lays his life down by leading the way and not following. He lays down his life by keeping a watchful eye for predators. And he's ready to defend if necessary. Just as Moses did, the shepherd would carry his staff. The staff was for several different things. It was for direction. They could take a staff and they could lead a sheep one way or the other. It was for protection. They could use it to fend off the wolves or anything dangerous. They would use it to smack bushes, to run out snakes, bugs, anything that might be lying in wait in the bushes to hurt them. But it was also for correction. He could take the hook and grab a sheep by the neck and say, you're going the wrong way. And so the shepherd's life was a sacrificial life. He didn't have to do it with his bare hands. The staff was used for direction, protection, and correction. But whenever it was necessary, whenever the time was right, whenever the situation dictated, the shepherd would step in and say, my life is worth getting in the way of harm to protect even just one of my sheep. And so not only does he guard us from our enemies, but he does it openly so that the enemies will know about it. Psalm chapter 23, we know this by heart. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Psalms 23, verses 4 through 5, they state specifically that not only does the rod and the staff of the shepherd protect, but it goes as far to say that he also prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemy. Openly, he doesn't hide it. He says, these are my sheep. I protect them. I feed them. I take care of them. And I'm not going to hide them. from. I'm going to let the enemy know that they're under my watchful eye. They're under my protection. And even in the presence of my enemy, I'm going to let them know that I'm willing to lay down my life for my sheep. So not only does a good shepherd's life sacrificial, but a good shepherd also takes ownership of his flock. In verse 12, Jesus makes a very interesting statement here. He says, a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and he leaves the sheep and flees. There's a difference between a hired hand watching over a flock and the actual owner watching over the flock. But when you become a part of the congregation, the family of God, when you become a child of God, when you become a member of his sheepfold. When you become one of his sheep, he says, I now take possession of your life. Your life is no longer yours. Your life is mine. And so is it just me or is commitment something that we're really lacking in today's culture? Do we have people stepping up and taking ownership of certain issues in our culture today? Do we have people stepping up and saying, you know, I, I, I want to be responsible for someone. I want to bring them into my family. I want to bring them into our church. I, I want to take ownership of this situation. And Jesus says there's a difference between someone who doesn't own something and someone who has just borrowed it, someone who is just a paid servant and a hired hand. The hired hand doesn't own the sheep or does he care for the sheep. His role is not as sacrificial as the owner of the flock, and he will not be as committed when danger arises. And so the depth of his ownership is revealed when Jesus tells the parable of the one lost sheep in Luke chapter 15. It says he leaves the 99. That's the only time that we will depart from the majority of the flock. He says, I've got one that I own. I don't know where he's at. You guys are safe right here for now, but I've got one that is, that is my sheep. And I want to go find out where he's at. What he's done. Why did he stray away from us? Is he in danger? Is he dead? Is he still alive? Is he sick? Is he caught somewhere? But that one sheep is one of my own, and I'm going to do whatever it takes to go and find him because I've taken ownership of him, and I don't want him to feel like that I've disowned him and neglected him and left him out on his own. So the good shepherd takes ownership of his flock. Not only is his life sacrificial, not only does he take ownership, but a good shepherd knows well about the condition of his flock. He knows exactly what's going on in their life. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known by my own. I know my own. He is no stranger to those that are within his flock. Why is that? Because the good shepherd is there with them at all times. Morning, noon, night, through the storms, through the winter, through the spring, through the summer, through the fall. It doesn't matter. 24-7, 365, the good shepherd that has taken ownership of his flock knows the condition of his flock because he's there with them at all times. He knows the sound he knows each one of them by name. He knows when they're not acting normal. And he knows when they've disappeared because that one sheep is the one that I've got to go looking for. The good shepherd is there with them at all times. And as Psalms 23, chapter 4 states as well, even though I go through the darkest valley, I will fear no danger. Why is that? Because you are with me. You haven't made yourself distant. You haven't made yourself foreign. You have taken ownership. And even during my darkest time, even through my hardest struggle, you're right there with me. 
You, you don't abandon me. You don't leave me. You, you don't leave me to take care of myself. The good shepherd is there. He knows well about the condition of his flocks. He also knows his own well enough to know what they are and what they are not capable of enduring. God's not going to put anything on you that's going to break you down or wear you down. It's going to be unbearable for you because he knows just exactly how much you can handle. When he says that he knows, this carries two different connotations with it. On the one hand, it means to know is a way of recognizing. Not only do I know you personally, not only do I know your name, not only do I know the sound of your voice, I, I can identify you because I know who you are. I know what you're going through. But on the second hand, it carries a different connotation. On the other hand, it also means to be familiar with them as well. When you start separating yourself from the rest of the flock, I know something's going on. When you start acting in a different way, I know that's not your normal characteristic. That's not your normal emotion. That's not your normal frame of mind. And I want to find out what's going on because I'm worried about your condition at the moment. His desire is not for you to stop in the valley that you're going through. He doesn't want you to stop in that valley and just die right there. But he wants to lead you through that valley into a greener pasture. He wants to lead you to a place that is much more beneficial for you. That dark valley is just a learning time. That dark valley is just a momentary infliction for you to learn something different about yourself. On the backside of that is going to be so much better because you're going to be so much stronger. And you're going to be in a much better place. You're going to be in a better condition than you were in before. So the good shepherd also wants to make sure that the entire flock is healthy. He's not going to feed some more than he'll feed the others. He knows exactly what it takes to nurture the entire flock. What about an infection? He, he knows that if, if an infection starts on one sheep, that could be detrimental to the entire flock. There could be some type of parasite that has landed on one of the sheep. They're scratching, they're itching, they're rubbing. I don't want that parasite infecting my entire flock. One of them's acting sick. I'm worried about the condition, the, the overall health and the overall safety of the entire flock. I can't let those things go unattended because if I do, they'll decimate the entire flock. A bad attitude from one stubborn sheep could cause a state of hostility from the other sheep that will bring insecurity to the entire flock as well. Panic attacks. I've got one that, that something's bothering him. I don't know what it is, but I've got to get this one sheep under control because <laughs> that bad attitude is going to rub off on the rest of them. And it won't take long before the entire flock is acting in the same way. It won't take long before the entire flock is in a state of panic, and I won't be able to control them if that happens. I'm worried about the condition of my flock, not only their physical health, but their mental health as well. Are they secure? Are they healthy? Are they happy? Jesus says, I know my sheep, and I know what it takes for them to function properly on a normal basis. I'm concerned about their condition. I'm not just concerned about what they'll do for me in the future. I, I, I'm concerned about their life and their happiness right here and right now. Proverbs chapter 27 verse 23 states this. It says, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Jesus cares for you personally is one of his own sheep, but he knows that what goes on in your life is overall beneficial to the entire flock as well. Because if you get down and out, if you're doing something in a servant-like attitude, in a servant position within the church, and all of a sudden something happens to you and you step out, guess what? 
there's an empty spot there. And somebody else has to pick up the slack. So the overall condition of the flock depends on the condition of each and every sheep. So when the good shepherd takes ownership of the whole flock, he's taking a personal interest in each and every one of them for the benefit of the entire flock. You see, he's not just concerned about your eternity. That's what Jesus came for. He said, I'll lay down my life for you so that you can have eternal life. But that's not my only concern is what Jesus says. He says, I want you to have life everlasting and life more abundantly. That's what we learned last week. He doesn't worry much about your past either. He is equally concerned about your here and now as he is anything else. What's going on in the life of my sheep right now? What's going on in their family, in their life? in their physical well-being, I've taken ownership of that sheep and now I'm worried about the condition of them because it's very, very important to me. So verse 16 creates somewhat of a break in between uh, Jesus talking about him being the good shepherd. But it's closely connected with what Jesus tells the Jews in verse 26. He says the other sheep What are these other sheep that he's talking about? He's talking to a specific crowd right here. My disciples, the 5,000 people that I fed, the multitudes that I've been teaching to, is that the flock that I'm worried about right now? He said, no. He said, there's other sheep that I have that you don't know about yet. And in this break in between this passage, between uh, 16 and 26, he's starting to talk to the Jews in specific. He said, not only of the house of Israel do I have a flock, but I have a flock that you don't know about yet. He's talking about the Gentile nation that will eventually receive the gospel as well. The other sheep he is referring to are the Gentiles who had not yet received the gospel. And Jesus points that out because of the disbelief of the Jews. And those who are presenting the questions, they weren't included in his flock yet. And they asked him this question, how long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They said, we don't know what's going on here. What what are you talking about, the good shepherd? They're not a part of his flock yet because he had just stated, my sheep know my voice. You're not hearing what I'm saying because you're still asking questions. And you haven't accepted me yet as the one true Messiah. And so that's when it goes into verse 27 about the importance of communication between the shepherd and his sheep. A good shepherd's life is sacrificial. He takes ownership of the flock. He knows well about the condition not only of the entire flock but each and every individual sheep within the flock. But a good shepherd also understands the importance of communication with his flock. Verse 27 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. How do the sheep hear his voice? He's got to be within earshot of them. He's got to be within the range of their hearing, so he's got to stay close. The sheep also have to stay as close to the shepherd as possible to hear his voice. And it's just like the Jews. They're hearing his voice, but they're not hearing his voice. (laughs) They're not comprehending what's come out of his mouth. They're hearing the words, but they're not hearing the message. So how do the sheep hear his voice? You see, the, the greater the distance becomes between the shepherd and the sheep, the fainter his voice begins to sound. The further away they stray, the more and more difficult it is for them to hear the voice of the good shepherd. And and so you hear today, if you truly are one of his sheep, then his voice is going to be the guiding directive of your life. Each and every day, each and every decision, 
each and every step that you make, am, am I hearing his voice today? When is the last time that I heard his voice? When is the last time that he's put something burning down inside of my heart, a burning desire? Because I clearly heard what he was saying to me on that day. This, this last mistake that I made, was I, without, was I outside of the range of his voice? Could I not clearly hear? What, what do I need to draw closer to him to hear that voice once again? If you truly are one of his sheep, then his voice is going to be distinctive. It's going to be clear. And you're going to be listening for it every step of the way in your life. The obedient sheep respond accordingly at the sound of his voice. But the stubborn sheep the disobedient sheep, they choose to go their own way even though they have clearly heard his voice. So several commentaries that I read, a couple of books that I read, I've, I've heard Charles Stanley speak on this before. They said one of the greatest lessons they've learned is by being in Israel, watching the shepherds and the sheep that they tend. He said there would be more than one shepherd gathered up in the morning and like we talked about in the sheep pen. They would all gather up in the same spot overnight, and there would be multiple flocks belonging to these shepherds. And I remember Charles Stanley saying, he said, now there's no way, they're going to be all day long separating these sheep and separating these flocks. He said, there's no way, this is going to be mass confusion. And he said, one by one, that shepherd would come out. Maybe he had a staff in his hand. And all he would do was start singing a song. Start speaking. And then as he left the sheep, uh, the sheep pen, one by one, his own sheep heard his voice and began following. And he said, before you know it, each shepherd had gone a different way. And the sheep pen was completely empty. And they were all following their own shepherd just because of the sound of his voice. He didn't have to smack them over the head. He didn't have to pull them with the hook. He didn't have to do anything special other than speaking the sound of his voice. And when the sheep heard the sound of that shepherd's voice, they said, well, there's my shepherd. I'm familiar with that voice. I've heard it before. That's not a stranger. That's my shepherd. That's the one that I want to follow. He's the one that's taken ownership of me, and he's the one that is concerned about my condition. I'm not going to follow these other guys because I don't belong to them. And they're not going to take near as good care of me as my owner will. So the good shepherd knew the importance of communicating with his sheep on a regular basis. So they would become more and more familiar with his voice. If you're truly one of his sheep, there's going to be no doubt when you hear his voice. There's not going to be any confusion and you're not going to listen to the outside voices that you're not familiar with. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. They don't follow anyone else. So last, not only is, is the shepherd's life sacrificial, not only does he take ownership, not only is he concerned about the condition of his flock overall, not only does he understand the importance of communicating with his flock on a regular basis, but a good shepherd is also committed to the longevity of his flock. He said, I'm not just worried about what's going to happen this week. I'm not just going to worry about what happens in the next month or so. But I'm in it for the long haul. I'm worried about the longevity. I, I know that if my sheep are happy, they're going to produce more within the flock. They're going to reproduce more sheep. They're going to give me a longer time with this herd. So each and every sheep of my flock, I want to make sure that their life is long and happy and they're satisfied. A good shepherd is committed to the longevity of his flock. So Jesus was not just investing in the life of the disciples that he was currently grooming. He was also investing in the future church. 
when, when John wrote this gospel, when Jesus was speaking these words, he was looking in the future to you, the church of today. He said, I'm making an investment, a long-term investment. Many of you have invested in IRAs. What's your number one concern? ROI. What's my return on investment? Because I don't want it for just a short term. I want to make sure that it's there for a long, long time. And Jesus says, I'm trying to build not only a flock right now, but in the future, Peter, <laughs> you're going to shepherd my flock. The, the flock that you don't even know about yet. I, I have sheep that you don't know about. They're out there somewhere. And Peter, you're going to be the one that goes to get them. And so right now, with that in mind, not only was Jesus thinking about the future church, what should we be thinking about? The church that will be coming along after us. We should be investing right now in future flocks, future churches, future congregations. We're not just worried about what happens here at First Baptist Church in the next month or so. We're in it for the longevity of this church. We're in the, for the longevity of the kingdom of God. Worldwide, not just here in Louisiana, not just here in Morgan City, but just like Jesus was planting seeds to grow for a long, long time, not only was he putting together a flock and taking care of a flock for a long, long time, the future of the church now depends upon us hearing the voice of the shepherd, allowing his Holy Spirit to guide us and work within us. Because here's, here's something that I've been thinking about over the past few weeks, and it really came to light yesterday. I, I was riding over to home with Dan, and he talked about how many thousands of people that he fed at, since he's been doing disaster relief. What, what would you say, Dan? Probably in the hundreds of thousands of people, that you, meals that you served. There's something that Jesus mentioned in John chapter 14. He said, the works that I do, you're going to do greater works. He was thinking long term then. Now, if you would have been in the crowd that day, if you would have been one of his disciples, you'd say, all right, now Jesus, I, I hear what you're saying, but so far you've walked on water. <laughs> you've raised someone from the dead. You've caused the blind to see. You're telling me that I'm going to be able to do these things? Jesus said, not only that, but you're going to do greater things. Long term. Longevity. You and my flock that I'm taking care of, right? Jesus said, you're in my flock, and eventually you're going to do greater. Now, was he talking about in quality or in quantity? I think he was talking about in quantity. Because I know of twice that Jesus fed 5,000, and you've already fed more than that just since you've been on disaster relief. Lives that Jesus touched, he said, you'll be able to do greater works than this because you'll have much more of an opportunity to do them than I just spent here in three years on this earth. He said the longevity of my flock must be established right now for you to be able to do these greater works. And so that's what the shepherd is doing. He's invested not just in the short term, but he's invested in the long term. The future of the church, it rests upon us right now and what we do with the time that we have. Don't ever let a day go by where you're not looking for some way to serve God and help build his kingdom. And then Jesus gives this awesome promise. I mean, I don't think that there's any bigger promise than this that you see happening at the tail end of this, this passage. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give them eternal life. Pay real close attention to what he just said. He didn't say you're going to earn eternal life. He didn't say you're going to get it some other way. He said, I'm going to give you eternal life. Why? Because the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And I'm worried about their longevity. 
Not just the time that they're here on this earth. Like, yes, absolutely. I want them to serve me with all their heart, soul, and mind while they're here on this earth. But I'm also going to give them an eternal reward. I give them eternal life. He willingly gives us what we don't deserve. And that we can never earn. The word eternal means for an unlimited duration. Forever. It's, it's not something that requires a new subscription from time to time. It never expires. Jesus says, what I give you is going to last for all eternity. And he says, once you are in my Father's hand, there's absolutely nothing at all that can pluck you out of it. The apostle says, neither height nor depth nor any created thing. Things on heaven, things on earth, things under the... There is absolutely nothing at all in this world. Once you are in the Father's grip, they can snatch you away from it. Jesus says, once I bring you into my flock, once I bring you into the fold, I'm taking ownership of you. I got you. (laughs) And I'm not going to let go. Never, ever. Is that the type of security that you have right now? Is that the assurance that you're living with each and every day? Last week he was the door in which the person enters and by no other means can enter. Today he is the good shepherd that takes care of your every need and provides you with eternal security so that you can live confidently in this life and walk through this life and not have to worry about Whether or not you are in his grip. I tell you what, when you become a Christian, when you become a born-again child of God, there there are things that you might worry about, but where you spend eternity at should never be one of them. You should be able to walk through this life confidently knowing I'm a child of God, heaven's my home, and it doesn't matter what happens here on this earth, I am firmly in the grip of God, and there's absolutely nothing that can snatch me out of his grip. He loves you, and there is nothing that you can do that will make him love you less. And there's nothing that you can do to where he'll say, you know what, I don't want you no more. He won't ever do that. Because here's your promise right here. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and neither will anyone snatch them out of my hand. And it's written time and time again, Throughout scripture. Whenever John writes his letters to the church. 1 John chapter 5 verse 13. He says these things I have written to you. Who believe in the name of the son of God. That you may. What was that word again? That you may know that you have eternal life. No doubt. Confidently walking through this life. He doesn't say, I've given you these things so that you may assume that you have eternal life. But he says, I want you to confidently know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you're my child. You're a sheep of my flock. If you wander away, I'm going to leave the 99. I'm going to go looking for you and bring you back. I'm not going to disown you, and I'm not going to turn loose of you ever, ever, ever. That's what the good shepherd does for us. He's making the, time, uh, the connection between time and eternity. Because what we see now is just the here and now. The things that we worry about are just in the here and now. What are, where am I going to eat lunch at today? What do I got to wear to work tomorrow? We're, we're worried about the things that we see here before us more than anything else. More than we are about eternity. The issue with many Christians today is that their view of eternity is not impacting their present state of being. If you want to become a doctor, what are you going to be studying? You're going to be studying medicine. I'm preparing for that. One of these days, I want to be a doctor. So right now, what I'm worried about is getting my... If you want to be a professional athlete, what are you worried about? I'm worried about my nutrition, my health, my diet, what I eat, my workout regimen. Those are the things that I'm worried about. But if you're a Christian, what you should, should you be worried about? My eternity. I'm working my way. I can't earn it. But right now, here on this earth, 
what I view of eternity should impact my here and now. It should change the way that I live. It should change the way that I act. It should change the way that I speak. It should change the way that I walk and talk. But most of all, it should change the way that you think about each and everything in your life. If you found out that today was your last day here on this earth, would it change the way you spent the rest of this day? Absolutely, it would. So if you know that heaven is your home, Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, and you're going to be with him through all eternity, it should change the way that you do things here in this life. Don't be so consumed by the here and now that you completely lose sight of your eternal goals. And so the reason Jesus came as a good shepherd was all about eternal matters. Are you under the care of the good shepherd? Can you honestly say that the Lord is my shepherd? Or are you one of those lost sheep that he's searching for? Are you not within the fold of the sheep flock or the herd yet? And, and so as you look at the nativity sets, they done blocked where I can't get down off the stage anymore. <laughs> I mean, look, look at this nativity scene right here. You, you see the most obvious things. The three kings are the majority. One shepherd here. Especially during this holiday season, we often lose sight of the importance of the shepherds on that day. Mary was the first one to carry the gospel because she had Jesus inside of her. But who was the first people to see and hear that the Messiah was born? It wasn't the kings. It wasn't the more significant people in society. The least became first. And on that night when Jesus was born, it was the shepherds. They were the first ones commissioned with carrying the good news because as they left from the presence of Jesus, what did they say? We must go tell everyone what we just saw. So the Lord is my shepherd. I know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Is he your shepherd? He's not a bad shepherd. He doesn't want to harm you. He wants to take care of you. He wants to provide you with the abundant life here and now. But the number one goal that he came for was to make sure that your eternal destination was secure. He was in it for the long haul. He says, I lay down my life for my sheep so that they will have that ability to live with my Father and me for all eternity. But you got to hear his voice. Is he speaking to you right now? Is there something stirring in your heart that says, I don't know for sure whether I'm one of his sheep or not. I don't know for sure if the Lord is my shepherd. Why not settle that doubt today? These two ladies that we baptized this morning, both of them came with me with confusion and doubt. And I explained to them the best that I could what Jesus can and wants to do with them. And now they live with that assurance and knowing that if today was their last day here on this earth, that they'd be in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ because they accepted him. Not only as their Savior, but as their Lord. And so that's what I want to invite you to do today. If you've never made that decision in just a moment, when the invitation starts, it's a public invitation. Whatever the Lord's asking you to do, I ask that you respond. The, the video will be off in just a moment. It's not going to be broadcasted. This is going to be a private, intimate moment. These first four pews will be opened up as altars. Just get along somewhere and do business with the Lord. If you've got questions or decisions that you need to make, you come see me and I'll pray with you and I'll explain to you the best way that I can how to make Jesus the shepherd of your life. 
Every head bowed and every eye closed. As the musicians come, we'll have a just two quick verses of a hymn.